Hello, and welcome back. Um, I'm Lindley Gwenap. I will be moderating the next session, which is on um, in-memory compute. Um, I'm excited to be hosting this session. Uh, in-memory compute is, is a rather new trend, but it is uh, something that could create a new breakthrough in uh, performance per watt for uh, many different kinds of applications. Um, we will be talking about uh, uh, AI as, as one potential workload, but uh, there are also other workloads that can benefit uh, from uh, this, this uh, new technology. So um, we've uh, lined up three companies that are taking uh, some uh, slightly different approaches, uh, but uh, trying to attack uh, the problem of uh, bringing uh, data from the memory into the compute unit reducing the amount of time and power required to do that. Um, so in order to uh, kick things off, um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Bob Haig from a GSI Technology, where he is the Director of Product Management. Uh, Bob has had uh, more than 30 years experience in the industry at uh, uh, Sony Semiconductor uh, for a long time, uh, where he worked on high-speed SRAM. And, um, and for the past five years, he's been helping uh, uh, work at GSI on this in-memory technology. So, um, uh, Bob, can you take it away? Hello, everyone. Thanks for your interest in our presentation today. My name is Bob Haig, and I'm a senior product architect at GSI Technology. For the first portion of the presentation, I'll be discussing the hardware architecture of a new in-memory associative processor that we've developed. Afterwards, my colleague Dan Alon will discuss some of the key advantages of the architecture, along with a an application example. For those who are unfamiliar with GSI, the company was founded in 1995 and has over two decades experience developing high performance memory, memory chips, both SRAM and DRAM. In late 2015, we acquired an Israeli company called Mikamonu in order to develop in-memory associative computing products, leveraging our SRAM design experience with Mikamonu's in-memory associative computing technology. Now let me start by looking at some at the primary issues that we intend to address with this new in-memory processor. Standard CPUs with their traditional von Neumann architecture and dozens of processor cores are highly efficient when performing complex computations on small data sets. However, they struggle with larger data sets due to the memory bottleneck imposed by the von Neumann architecture. Additionally, the energy required to transfer data between the CPU cores and the shared memory is high due to the relatively long distances between the cores and the memory. GSI's goal was to develop a processor that is highly efficient at simple, massively parallel computations on large data sets, both from a performance and power standpoint. We address this by implementing millions of simple programmable bit processors that perform Boolean operations on individual data bits. The bit processors utilize in and near memory processing techniques to perform the Boolean operations, which can be sequenced over multiple cycles to perform more complex computations. The bit processors are tightly coupled to distributed local memory to provide huge data bandwidth between them. And because the distance between a bit processor and its local memory is very short, the energy required to transfer data between them is very low compared to standard CPUs. We refer to the device as an associative processor because data elements in the bit processor's computational memory are accessible by content as well as by address. This makes them well suited to exact and similarity search applications and other applications that involve relatively simple computations on large data sets. Our initial associative processor is called Gemini. It has 2 million bit processors comprising 48 megabit of associative memory, which can perform 840 trillion Boolean operations per second at 400 megahertz. Peak compute performance for 8 bit integer add, for example, is 25 tera ops per second. And peak 128 bit TCAM search performance is 1 trillion searches per second. The Gemini APU has 96 megabits of distributed local memory that is tightly coupled to its bit processors, which we refer to as L1. 
The L1 to bit processor data bandwidth is 210 terabits per second for the chip. Typical thermal design power is only 60 watts, although it varies depending on the application. The Gemini APU is mounted on a standard PCI card we call Lita G and is currently shipping. As illustrated on the left, the bit processor comprises 24 dual port 12T memory cells plus some additional combinatorial logic. You can think of the memory cells as bit processor registers. If multiple memory cells are read simultaneously, the result on the read bit line is the logical AND of the memory cell data. The bit processors are organized into sections, 2000 per section. You can think of each section as a 2K vector processor all 2K bit processors in a section execute the same instruction on its respective data. The instruction comprises the read enable and write enable signals that control memory cell access, plus various control signals performing other Boolean operations on the bit processor data in addition to the AND on the read bit line, and for storing data or computation results in the bit processor memory. 16 sections are combined to form a bank, creating a 2K by 16 array of bit processors is illustrated on the right. Each bit processor in a bank is connected to its north, south, east, and west neighbors as shown by the highlighted bit processor on the right. These connections are used to transfer data and computation results between bit processors very quickly. Because computations are performed at the bit level, the architecture can compute with any size data element, integer, fixed point, or floating point, doesn't matter. Oftentimes, software treats the 16-bit processors in each column of the bank as a word processor. For example, if we want to add two 16-bit operands, one bit of each, operation, of each operand can be stored in each section in the bank along a single column, and the north-south connections between bit processors in the column can be used to propagate the carry result of each bitwise add operation to the next section. Distributed local L1 memory supplies data to the bit processors as illustrated in the diagram. Each L1 block and the bit processors it connects to are implemented on the same column pitch to minimize the distance between them. Specifically, each L1 block connects to four bit processors via a local bus highlighted in blue in the diagram. The architecture provides an L1 to bit processor bandwidth of 8K bits per cycle per bank. Additionally, the 16-bit processors per column in the bank are connected to a common bus highlighted in red in the diagram that provides additional data transfer capability. Now let's look at the bit processor computation capabilities in more detail. As discussed, they perform Boolean operations on their respective data. The Boolean operations are initiated via memory read operations and the bit processor uses, read register, uses a read register to capture the computation results generated by those read operations. Read logic is implemented before the read register that can perform AND, OR, and XOR operations between new, re new read results on the read bit line and previously generated results from the read register or write box before the new computation result is then captured in the read register. Each bit processor utilizes a write box to select various data sources that can be stored in the memory, including the local read register. After a read operation has generated a computational result in the read register, the result can then be stored in the bit processor memory via a write operation. The write operation can overlap with a new read operation, provided they access different memory cells. The computation result can be inverted in the write logic before it is stored in order to generate NAND, NOR, and XNOR results. When a write operation is initiated, it can be inhibited based on the state of the write data rather than storing the write data unconditionally. This provides selective write capability in the 2K bit processors in a section that's, that share the same write enable signals. It's a powerful tool and is used frequently by our software. Lastly, read register output from the 2K bit processors in a section can be logically ORed together via the RSP bus. RSP is short for response. The RSP result can be sent to the ARC processor in each core as a computation response, hence the bus name, or stored in the bit processor memory via the write mux. This is useful when software needs to know if any of the bit processors in a section have produced a true com 
computation result. For example, for a search or compare operation. The Gemini chip has four cores, each of which has 16 banks of bit processors in L1, as you can see in the figure. Each core has an ARC processor, a section, a section execution unit, instruction memory, and other components used to generate the instructions to the bit processor and L1. The SEU can generate up to four unique bit processor instructions per cycle. A particular instruction can be mapped to any of the 16 sections in a bank, and all 16 banks per core execute the same set of one to four instructions with the same section mapping. Because of the same relative sec because the same relative sections in all 16 banks execute the same instruction, you can think of them as a single 32K vector processor. The SEU can also generate one L1 instruction, basically either a read or a write operation, per cycle to send data to the bit processors or store data from them. All L1 blocks per core execute the same instruction. As discussed, there are four cores per chip as illustrated in the drawing on the left. The figure on the right is the actual chip layout. Now let me turn the presentation over to Dan. Thank you, Bob. In my part of the talk, I want to highlight how APUs are used to solve a basic problem in graph analytics and how this brings about the advantages of the architecture, namely the parallel processing, associative computing, and energy efficiency. So we're looking to solve the graph shortest path problem. Given a source node and a target node, the problem has many applications. For example, getting driving directions when the graph represents a map and cities are nodes and roads are edges connecting the cities. So basically we're going to treat nodes as keys, treat edges as values, and basically store the graph in associative memory where each associative word processor stores a key and the list of values. We shall see how Dijkstra's algorithm is computed by APU. In this example, we consider undirected graphs for simplicity. So take the graph at the top and the table at the bottom. The node A in the graph is basically loaded to word processor index I. The key is A, and A is connected to basically two other nodes in the graph, B and X. So in the list of values of A, we see the list is starting with the node B and a distance of six, and so on and so forth. The edges marked in red are actually the shortest path between A and C in this particular graph. But for our case, it doesn't matter in which exact word processor we store each node. So we're going to ignore the word processor indexes for the rest of the slides. Okay, so we start. We start by loading the graph to associative memory as shown in the table to your right. Here is the list of nodes. Each node is stored in a word processor and we throw in a few variables used by the software to compute the algorithms. Specifically, there is a variable which has the distance to the source, to A, here in this case, and we initialize all nodes to distance of infinity when we start the algorithm. Say that our task is basically to find the shortest path from A to C, so A is the source and C is the destination. We start by setting the current node to the source, A, and this is shown in red in this table. We also set the parent node of A to A to itself, being the first node. And we call this node A as the current node. Okay, so now you see the graph to the left and the associative memory to your right. Now we start the basic iterations of the algorithm. Our first task is to update all the unvisited neighbors of the current node, which is A. Okay, so we need to find all the neighbors of A which are unvisited. This is easy. It's done by associative search. So basically we search the list of values across all the nodes for the value A. The key is A and we search all the values for A. And we also search for flag visited equals zero. We only want to find unvisited nodes. In this case, they are all unvisited but A. So it's easy to see that in this graph, only two nodes match A as a neighbor, that's B and X. Okay, next, once we find them, go, go back please one slide, sorry. Once we find them, we also want to update their routing. So we update the states of those nodes if routing, if getting to those nodes through A is shorter than their present routing state. Now, getting to B through A is, takes a distance of six and it's shorter than the initial value of infinity. So we update B and we also update X 
to one, going to x from a if this is of one. And we only want to update only these two nodes. We don't want to update any other nodes. So this is basically a selective update. Okay, so we search and we update. The important thing to note here is that both search and update are fully parallel operation in associative memory. These operations are done in parallel across all the nodes in the graph. Okay, now this iteration continues by basically setting the next current node to the unvisited node in the graph, which has the minimal distance to the source. In this case, it would be x. x has a distance of one to the source, b has six, and now the rest has infinity. So basically we want to change the next current node to a, to x, sorry. So we mark x in red in this, uh, in this uh, label. And then we iterate over all these steps until we're reaching the destination C or until running out of options. Now, sorry, can you go back one slide, please? I just want to mention that finding that node X has the minimum distance to A is also an associative operation in memory, in associative memory. In, in the conventional CPUs, to finding the minimum value is a serial operation. You have to scan all the, all the nodes to get the minimal value. Here, this is all done in parallel across all the nodes in the graph that are stored in the memory, in the associative memory. This uh, is an associative algorithm. So again, we iterate. Next one. Yeah, so again, we iterate over those two steps until we're reaching our destination or until we're writing out of options, which means we can't reach the end in any case. Okay, so in summary, how did we do that? We started by using Boolean functions to code arithmetic functions that we use in the algorithm. Then we employed the data level parallelism across all the word processors in the processor to search and update uh, all the nodes simultaneously. We use the selective update mechanism according to the data to, ab to be able to update only the nodes that needs to be updated. We use associative search key and value to find nodes that are, we are looking for. And we use the global operation, minimal or maximum global operation, to find basically the next current node. Okay, so now tune in to a different aspect, which is energy efficiency. How do we compare APU with the CPU in this respect? So in the CPU, there is the, what we call the power wall. Basically, the energy cost of moving the data between the memory could be the cache, the layer one cache, layer two cache, layer three cache, or DRAM. So moving data between the memory and the core is much higher than the energy cost of doing the actual computation at the ALD operations at the core, once the data is in the core. So here's a table below to compare dynamic energies of APU and CPU for doing basically two operations. One operation, the first one is just the moving data. It's a copy operation. Copy operation from one uh, source to destination in the memory. So let's take data in L3 cache in the CPU I take L3 cache because the size of L3 cache in CPUs are, is comparable to the size of data that we have in APU in memory, L1 memory. So let's compare a copy between a CPU and APU. For a CPU to move four kilobytes of data, it's 1500 nanojoules. And for an APU to move the same amount of data would consume 15 nanojoules. So it's, APU takes only 1% of the energy that we take on a CPU to move that data. Now, if we want to do a Boolean operation, say a logical OR, again, on those 4K bytes of, uh, of data, two operands of 4K bytes, then for a CPU, the energy would be about 2,000 nanojoules. For APU, it would be about 24 nanojoules. And again, the energy would be roughly 1% to consume in APU versus a CPU. And that's, as Bob mentioned, that's because of the actual short traces that we have to move the data from the memory to the processor itself within the APU. To conclude, basically, I want to, this, again, mention the advantages of the architecture and match them with what we just said. So APU is a parallel processor with 2 million bit processor. It's capable of associative computing, so it can do trillion TCAM operations per second. And it's energy efficient, which means dynamic energy is about 1% of what it takes in a CPU to do those data movement and logical operations on the data itself. And you're all invited to our breakout session where we will show a demonstration of another application domain of the APU in search. Thank you.